All right. How's it going? Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Know Your Gear live podcast, episode 308. <laughs> Hope everybody had a good week. And uh, it, was a, yeah, it was a good week. I think it was a good week. Feels like a good week. It's a good week. I'm going to go with a good week. All right. Um, so I'm sure we have a lot of questions, a lot of subjects to get into. Um, I have some that were emailed me to me this week. Like, and, um, and, uh, I have some early riser questions as well. So we can jump into all that stuff as always. Let's, let's get into it. Um, just to point out real quick, if you see somebody with a blue name and a wrench, I keep checking my neck. Sorry about that. Uh, and, uh, if you see somebody with a blue name and wrench, that means our moderator, they're here to help. So if you have anything that's uh, happened during the discussion you need help with, they're there. It's like, so thank them for that. Thank you guys for that. And also thank you to, um, the, uh, the, uh, channel members and the patrons who sponsor these shows without you guys, this wouldn't happen. So I super appreciate that very, very much. Okay. Let's get into it. Uh, I have some early questions. The first one is, uh, the very first question today that was put in was from 3J Music, who says, hey, Phil, thoughts on Samic brand guitars? Um, Samic is an, uh, mainly an OEM, which means they're a uh, manufacturer who makes guitars for a lot of other companies. And um, they also make their own brand as well. And of course, um, because of that, uh, they can, because they make so many companies of guitars, they can make their own brand. I have played many Samics over the years. Um, the originally ones that were in Korea. Now most of them are going to be Indonesia. And of course, a lot of uh, anything acoustic is going to be mostly China now. And, um, very good stuff. I got a lot of good things to say. I always like their basses. I like their guitars. It's really one of those things. Like it's kind of like court, court guitars or sometimes referred to as court tech as in they're building everyone's guitars, so it's hard to say like, oh yeah, their guitars are not that great. You know they gotta make good guitars. They make guitars for everyone at a much higher price point. And usually the, the game with the OEM is they will build you the same quality of guitar, but maybe with more features at a lesser price because their brand isn't as strong as the brands they make for. And uh, and um, so there you go. That's my thoughts on Samic. Samic really, I think, focuses more on acoustics now, more than electrics. That's, I just remember, I used to be a dealer for Samic, uh, and Court, by the way, but Samic, I remember like each year, it seemed like more and more they became, uh, dealers of, uh, you know, uh, acoustics over electric guitars. So just to let you guys know. Um, and that was pretty much the core of your question, right? What are my thoughts on it? They make good stuff. So they're not really in the uh, YouTube game. In other words, they're not sending out products. I, not that I know of. They don't send any products out for review or anything like that. So who knows? Um, so that's it. That's it. You know, also on a side note, I used to have this really cool Samic bass that I got rid of and I really, really regret, which was this uh, half size bass. It was just fantastic. If I had any idea, I knew if I knew what I had, I would have kept it. It was such a cool bass. Uh, it was a Corsair, I believe. Corsair something, but it was a short scale Corsair. It was so tiny and played so great. And um, I got rid of it because I never played it and I thought I was going to take it for travel and I never did it. So I got rid of it. But to be honest with you, now you can't find anything that small. Not like that. That was pretty crazy. Um. Okay. Just looking at any comments before I go. Okay, hold on a second. Just reading some comments. Sorry, guys. Okay. Uh, next came from Eric. Eric said, what did Eric say? He says, Eric says, how come gear podcasts so rarely mention Rickenbacker uh, guitars? Iconic brand, but you barely know they exist if you get in your into, uh, if you get info from YouTube. You know, there's a ton of brands that you're absolutely right about Rickenbacker being I would say top five, absolutely top 10 guaranteed as brands you're not going to see on guitar YouTube and, and, and guitar, uh, YouTube, uh, guitar, YouTube and a uh, podcast. Let me, let me explain why there's a ton of reasons and they're not, not what you think they are. I'm sure. But first let me give you my reasoning why I don't really feature them as, as a guitars. Uh, of course, not, not the bass is just the guitars. Cause I don't really do a whole lot of bass content. So as guitars, 
I am not a huge fan of the neck uh, dimensions. Me personally, I had a Rickenbacker. It was one of the best sounding playing guitars I've ever owned. It was fantastic. Uh, I'm a huge Tom Petty fan. So of course, like, you know, it's just like, right? Make a strum a chord and that's all you need, right? However, I always felt like the neck was a little small and I'm not going to say I regret getting rid of it, but it was me pre my YouTube life. It was probably a year or two before I even made a YouTube video and, or maybe it was right after I did a first YouTube video. Either way, if I knew I was going to do YouTube, I would have kept it because I, at the time I just couldn't physically think of a reason to own this guitar. I was like, ah, I'm not really into the neck shape because the neck size is very narrow for me and I have a larger hands and uh, tone wise, there's, it's got a unique, cool tone, but there's a lot of cool guitars out there like Tellys and, and, uh, uh, Dan Electro's that I have that give me those kind of cool, cool tones too. So yeah, Matt says broomstick necks, very tiny. Uh, but like I said, if I knew I was going to do YouTube videos, I would have kept it. Definitely done some videos with it. That being said, cause I don't have one. <laughs> that's why it's not featured on the channel there. Uh, so th that's the main reason it's just, they don't do YouTube content as a company that I know of. And, uh, they don't reach out to YouTube channels and, and share product with us to get it in front of your faces. Um, there's really no retailers I know that are pushing it, uh, to, as an, as a product and cause that way it's not going to get any. So the only way it's going to get on a channel, somebody owns it and let's be clear, you got to have a real specific reason to, that's a very specific, just like their basis. It's a very specific instrument for a specific type of player. So it's not so generalized in my opinion. It's like an instrument that's like, you know, I guess if I'm checking the box, if I want every single type of guitar, I guess that's one to put on the list. But you know, if you're just checking the list of stuff you like, it's not in my wheelhouse. But, uh, the big reason you don't see it on other channels is because they don't send anybody, they don't send anybody guitars. And, uh, let's face it, you know, you can't buy all these guitars to put on your channels. You just can't, um, you know, not logically, especially that guitar. And that's the second part of this. Let's be honest. It's not a big draw guitar. So what I mean by that is that's the second thing you see. So main reason is you're going to see on a lot of ch channels talking about guitars. You're going to talk, talk about the guitars that people want to see. You're going to talk about guitars that, um, that, uh, are being sent to them by companies. And of course our personal guitars and Rickenbacker really doesn't, our uh, Rickenbacker doesn't really fall into any one of those cat categories. They're not really a guitar sent to you channels. They're not really, um, owned by a ton of people and, there's not any click potential if you put them, you know, if I said, hey, I check out a Rickenbacker, it's not going to draw a lot of views. So, I uh, thought I saw some comments about it. Hold on a second. So, yeah, Richard's saying Rickenbacker sells everything they build. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, they're a, I've talked about them on the channel. We've talked about the brand. I've never shown any of them. We've talked about them in length on the channel for years. Um, so uh, everything from their bases to their... Uh, I even think of this. I think at the uh, last NAM show, last 2022 NAM show, uh, they were the main brand I talked about about the NAM show. They made the big announcement last year that I was super happy about, which is... They were going to on their guitars. They already did it, I guess, on the basses too. They were going to one truss rod instead of the two dual truss rods. Not dual action, but actually two truss rods. And um, I thought that was big news and very cool. And no one cared. <laughs> I thought it was the most interesting thing. In fact, I, I, if you find that episode, so, you know, I think it's because they're all timestamped. Just go back to the NAMM show 2022 and find what I talked about at NAMM show. I said that was the most interesting thing at NAMM show. And it literally... Drew no, no, nobody to, to the conversation. So that's uh, the main thing. Um, okay. Uh, let's see real quick. Uh, Rexomatic says, Hey, uh, have you visited black mountain guitars in Cape Creek? I've never heard of them. So maybe you have to check them out one day. So, um, it's not a store I'm familiar with. I'd have to look online and see what they carry. Maybe it's worth checking out. Uh, Chess Roots Lo Love says, oldest rule, advertising works. Absolutely. Look, man, I've said it before. I'll say it again. 
there's a lot of opinions, of course, about the YouTube arena and, you know, channels being sent product. And here's the re realistic part of it. There's never been, was, <laughs> there never was a cheaper way to advertise your product than the social media platform. Now I say was, it's still very inexpensive, very, but not what it was just a couple years ago. It was, oh, I mean, to be honest with you, for the longest time it was free and companies weren't coming and um and i'll, I'll tell you just tell from my perspective and then I'll, I'll just end with this from my perspective it's tough because companies now kind of approach you when they really should have approached you four years ago and they ask you for things that you're like yeah i don't even like i don't have time to do it you have to find another channel you have to go find somebody else i'm you know we're booked and so, and, and, uh, I, I used to think about this just a couple of years ago, I used to refer to channels constantly to, to companies. I'd be like, oh, check out this channel and this channel and this channel too. And now when I talk to them and we Skype real quick, they're booked. So the channels are mostly booked. Um, so it's not, it's still the cheapest way to, to advertise, but, and there's nothing as far as I know, that's any less expensive than this, but, uh, um, but it's not what it was. Okay. Uh, Roman wants to know, will I try a Brian May guitar? Uh, again, same thing, right? Remember, I've said this before. There's only three reasons I make a video. It's either because uh, the viewers want to see it, I want to do it, or a company asks for it. And then it's just that way. So, so like I said, that's what's cool about this show. You guys bring this stuff up and then sometimes it gets in my head. Maybe by Sunday night, I'm like looking up those guitars going, let's get one on the channel. So there you go. Yeah, Matt says cheapest with the most specialized audience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like I said, it, it's again, it's a boring, to me, this is the boring talk, the advertising talk of the YouTube arena. But um, I know some of you watching, especially on the rebroadcast, are uh, our businesses. You know, a lot of guys watch this that have stores or they have, you know, product lines or they're small companies, a lot of small businesses, because they're, you know, it's a community here and they're kind of looking at to see what we're talking about. And, and, and it's nice to, you know, kind of let them know because they're, they, they're missing out. So, um, Steve Wright wants to know, Phil, are you keeping the Kiesel A2? If so, what are you contemplating getting rid of? So the Kiesel, he's talking about the Kiesel A2 that I unboxed, that they sent me. The big question on that is, it's really about Kiesel and not so much me. I don't know, remember, I wasn't given any real information about the guitar. Like, I don't know if it was sent to me as like a, hey, check this out and keep it, or check this out and just unbox it. Um, I didn't ask, <laughs> right? Um, like I said, I have, I have, or I have a custom Kiesel coming that I, that I dreamed up, uh, for a specific reason. Please allow me a little vagueness on this because it's a, it's a, it's a video for me. It's a video I want to share with you guys. Not about Kiesel, uh, it has nothing to do with the guitar. It's the Kiesel is the vehicle of the story, so to speak. It's what I had done to the Kiesel. Um, I never had this particular thing done to a guitar before that I asked Kiesel to do this guitar and uh, it's because it'll tie in. So again, I don't get too down, down that road. Um, but, uh, when I talked to them about building this particular, uh, features on a guitar, they had mentioned that the A2 was coming out. Would I like to be an A2? And it's a slightly different version of Aries. Aries is their number one seller. And I said, yeah, let's do that. And then, like I said, um, because of me t taking too long on the options, because like I said, I dreamed this all up and I wasn't confirming it fast enough. They weren't able to get it to me in time for what they wanted was a launch of those products. So they um, sent me a different A2. Uh, now my biggest fear is the A2 they sent me is going to be a thousand times better than the one I dreamed up. It sure looks a lot better. In fact, in fact, there might even be a humorous video in, or at least an Instagram poster of like a picture of like how crazy beautiful their work of art they sent that they dreamed up in minds like this madhouse goofy mess. Um, but, uh, <laughs> so to answer your question, yeah, I would love to keep the guitar. Um, it's just like I said, at first I have to find out if it's available. Uh, I just have been too busy. So, so, you know, to even talk to anybody. So if they haven't reached out to me, I, which they haven't, I don't have time yet to reach out to them, but, uh, what would I get rid of? I have a bunch of guitars to get rid of. So right now it'd be an easy time to acquire a guitar. I thin the herd. Um, there's there, we call it downstairs cause that's physically downstairs from where I'm at. That's where they're at. The guitars are downstairs. I have a bunch of guitars that I'm getting rid of. Um, as you guys know, I 
I won't bring in new guitars unless I get rid of some guitars. And then sometimes it's just time. Like I'm just not feeling these guitars. It's time for them to go. So I have some of those. Okay. Okay. Um, Rich C says, Hey, I blow glass. I was wondering if there would be a market, uh, for custom. I don't know how to say that borrow. So I, I don't want to mess it up. Guitar knobs. I'm assuming some kind of glass guitar knobs. Uh, probably not just curious. So I have a friend or acquaintance, I should say his name's William Wiggins. Uh, if you guys remember, I've done some videos for Wiggins pickups, W I G G I N S William Wiggins, Wiggins pickups. You can uh, check them out. Actually, let's do that. Let's do that while I'm talking. Um, and uh, at, I've said this before that I know William because my wife and and I were our friends and were friends in high school with his wife, who's an artist, and she does. She also blows glass. And I'm going to share with you guys right now. Okay. And what um. What he does, obviously, is cool pickups, but she was doing glass knobs. So what I don't know, what I don't know, I'm looking, hold on. Uh, I don't see her stuff here. But to answer your question, I, I, I'm assuming what you're talking about is something like that. See how beautiful these pickups are? Look at that. Look at that. Can we just take a second to take in the art? He also does cigar box guitar uh, pickups. His pickups are extremely reasonable uh, priced. Just to give you a reference, let's take a look. Hey, uh, let's look at, can we go up to your pickups and we go to humbucker sets? Yeah, see $122. These are all carved out of wood. Look, you get skulls. I have a set of skulls he gave me as a gift. So, uh, so there you go. That's uh. Uh, to answer your question, I've seen glass knobs. His wife was doing some. I don't know if she was just doing it uh, a little bit at a time or she was trying to make a go of it. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I, so the answer to your question, I don't know. But I was got, hoping I was going to pull them up and say, like these, and then maybe that would give you an idea of the market. Maybe there's, you know, but um, <laughs> unfreaking believable wants to know, do wood pickups suffer the same issue similar to fret sprout? No, <laughs> they don't. Uh, there's not really any, the shrink, the wood shrinking wouldn't really do anything. It's not like they, the worst case scenario is they could crack because they're pretty thin, but um, I'm sure the wood is, is properly dried. Uh, I can tell you this, it is very rare that I've seen small builders of anything when it comes to wood, having wood drying issues as a whole because of the fact that when you're buying we know the problem buying wood in mass quantity like some of the big manufacturers are that's what's coming through is some i'm sure some wood that's not properly dried not everything's going to be labeled correctly i mean there's gonna be a ton of reasons i don't want to say that's exactly the problem but you understand there's more variables going on um which is why if you notice on fret sprout i don't really give it a whole lot of of hell so to speak um this week uh i did mention that when i did the fender ultra that i was a little shocked by that i obviously shocked because I, mean, I I didn't say it in the video. There was some question. I'm going to say it here so you guys know. Uh, um, but I didn't say it in the video. In the video, I said, if you guys watched it, I said, hey, it was sent to another YouTube channel. And that YouTube channel asked me to fix the problem. And also, hey, you know, if I want to do a deep dive, I could do a deep dive. Um, the important part of that channel, I did mention they were a bigger channel. The important part of the channel is they're in Florida. So <laughs> I don't know why I didn't think to mention that. It was one of those things like I was reading comments and then after reading comments going, oh, I should have said that because somebody was saying like, what do you expect in a dry climate? And I'm like, oh, I should have pointed out that the guitar came out of the box with Fred Sprout from California and the box was opened in Florida. So it went from California to Florida <laughs> and then it sat in Florida for uh, weeks and weeks and weeks and then came here to Arizona and it was already and uh, and then uh, from that guitar. So, you know, um, because I didn't know necessarily I would do a video about that guitar. That guitar sat in a humidified case where I tried to add moisture back into the guitar at no luck whatsoever. 
So sometimes that works. I always in the comments, people are like, don't correct fruit sprout, just add moisture. Yeah, you know what? Wood's a sponge, but that doesn't, it's not guaranteed, right? Sometimes you cannot rehydrate the instrument enough to correct the fret sprout. What I can tell you is uh, if you're, as long as you're not going over the top aggressive with correcting fret sprout, I've never seen it where the wood expands and all of a sudden you have a problem that, you know, like people are like, oh, and then you'll have gaps between the fret and the end of the fretboard. I've never seen it. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen. I'm just, so like I said, if so, don't please don't send me an email me and tell me you've seen it. I'm sure it happens. What I'm telling you is thousands of guitars in the desert. I've never seen that issue that particular issue so it doesn't prove it doesn't exist it just means it's not as it's not a rampant thing that i have to worry about somebody says was it from beato uh no the uh it was not from rick beato <laughs> he's got his own guy he's a he's got his own tech guy uh uh and so you know i've given you enough clues obviously it's a big channel way bigger than mine and it's in florida there you go you figure out the channel by the way there's no um uh the answer to uh, the question that's not being asked right here is why am I being vague about it? It's pretty simple because I don't want what anything I did in the video to be uh, to hurt that channel. Remember, Fender is sending that channel on the regular lots of Fender guitars. So, and keep in mind, remember, Fender doesn't send me anything. So, uh, not anymore. They used to, and then it kind of stopped. Uh, <laughs> but I'm sure. But I don't want to. You know, obviously, I don't want to uh, hurt any relationship they might have even though I don't think the channel cares uh, what I do because they're a good friend. Um, okay, so... Okay, now you guys are talking about something else. All right, I think I covered whatever we're talking about. Let's go to the next subject. I kind of feel like today is going to be just a whatever kind of day. Like, I don't know if we're going to have any clear big topics to talk about. Um, the... the uh, the next one came from Jeff who says, Hey, I was looking at buying a Kiesel, but I'm concerned about tongue oil neck. This came off the ask, know your gear, uh, website, by the way, uh, know your gear podcast.com. This was a mailed in question. Thank you, Jeff. And, um, and it was penned as an interesting question because of the tongue oil question. Um, it makes perfect sense. He said he wants to know if there's any concerns about just only having a tongue oil finish on the guitar. What is required to maintain the neck? How often does the oil need to be reapplied? So in my experience, you could never apply the oil again and be fine, right? Uh, initially, you're just doing that, um, one, to hydrate the wood for aesthetically, a little bit of aesthetics to make the wood look nice, uh, obviously a little bit to make sure that it's a little hydrated. What I will tell you, though, uh, before I go down any of those weird roads with it, if you have a tongue oil finished neck, in other words, a natural neck that has a, a, a tongue oil or a gunstock oil you know, on it or some kind of like that, what I will tell you is, from my experience, if you play it a lot, it doesn't need anything. It will literally pull all the oils off your skin. I know, gross, right? Uh, <laughs> into the finish. Um, and it will eventually look like, if you play the guitar a lot, it'll look like it's lacquered. Um, if you've been a uh, heavy player, you've seen this, you've done it to your guitar. However, however, uh, if you've ever bought a used guitar that was really old, that was played heavily and it has a, a natural finish on the neck and it looks like it's got a finish, uh, believe it or not, sometimes that could just be literally the polishing uh, from the oil of your hand, of somebody's hand and the sweat and just the friction of polishing it. Um, it just looks like it's got a finish. So now that being said if you were to get a tongue oil finished natural neck a neck natural uh maple neck with tongue oil finish and not play it ever <laughs> just make it a wall art and you live in a dry climate like i do i'm you, i might say once a year why not put some on the finish of the guitar that would be more than enough um again it's um wood is really cool because it really tells you what it needs um, just like a rosewood fretboard, I, I've said this before, you know, if you ever really get really dehydrated, your, your lips, your, your lips become chapped and they become chalky, um, because there's just no moisture in your skin and the, the rosewood will do the same thing. It'll actually not only look, uh, dry, it'll look like it has like a chalkiness on it. And, uh, you may want to rehydrate it a little bit. Um, same thing with all kinds of woods. You'll see it's really dry and it's time to add some, some kind of, uh, uh, rehydration type of rehydration to it so 
but so yeah uh richard says he love true oil finish it works perfect i i agree true oil finish works great um but it's not my big thing with these kind of questions is what i really want to convey to you jeff is uh it's not something you need to worry about it's not a common occurrence you're not going to see a maple neck with a big crack down the middle of it because it was not um it wasn't you know you didn't apply any finish to it it takes a lot maple is a pretty resilient wood uh when it dries it's pretty i would dare not say bulletproof but i dare say it's pretty resilient i mean it's a pretty resilient wood it's really strong so okay so yeah <laughs> matthew says navel necks need no finish and dirty hands this is the way so you know uh you know the most famous that i can think of person when it comes to the natural uh maple necks and the don't needs finish just dis display it was eddie van halen i mean he believed that basically the oils and sweat in his hands were going to be the all the guitar needed so his his necks were notoriously known and he would not allow you to clean his necks uh and fretboards is uh, my understanding so okay Yeah, ER is like, those oils don't stay wet. They slowly harden over time and become a solid finish. Absolutely. Yep. It's so like I said, it's one of those things, like I said, it's not something you have to worry about. I get it, though. It's like, hey, you kind of think like, you know, if it's if the wood's not sealed, right? And I and, and so, you know, I, there's a ton of reasons why people come to the conclusion they come to. Jeff's question's great because, like, think about this. If, I, if this was a um, handyman channel, this would be the last piece of advice I'd give you about your deck outside. Oh, you're building a deck this weekend? Make sure to put some ceiling on that, right? Like, that's not something a guitar neck is... Like, that's probably where Jeff's question's anchored into is, like, does it need to be treated and sealed, um, you know, and protected from the elements? And in this case, that's not what has to happen. So, especially a maple neck, right? Like, we can we could open up the discussion if we're maybe talking about a solid rosewood neck or even a mahogany neck. And that, even then, I still pre I feel pretty... Con pretty solid on the you don't need much to do anything um some necks like a like a wingay uh you can use beeswax some harder woods will use beeswax but a lot of that has to do with again just making it look pretty so okay did i get all the early risers and the questions from the hold on Okay. Uh, Randall's message was most of his guitars need a fret job. Frets hang off, uh, hang off the fretboard. In other words, any tips? Um, well, yeah. I mean, you have to address that. It's obviously it's it's because, like I said, the neck is shrank. It's a uh, it's really common nowadays. Again, this is my whole point. Again, it's the type of neck and the expense of the neck is where you want to factor that in. Um, the uh i definitely recommend if you uh if you're not spending extreme if you're not spending a lot of money on guitars okay and what i've seen a lot of money is thousands of dollars on guitars where it makes it makes sense to definitely go to a tech even though it's something you can do yourself and you just want to make sure again you're talking about an expensive instrument and you're concerned about damaging it i understand that but for the most part you can learn to do all this stuff yourself it's pretty simple to do and um even though some of those stumac tools look expensive Comparing them to the work labor, labor, you know, cost of having somebody else do it. I mean, it's a fraction of the cost and um, you, you're investing in yourself. You're teaching yourself. I have a ton of videos doing it. There's a ton of videos out there to do it. Fret Sprout is some of the things I focus the most on, on my channel because it's becoming the most common repairs. I tend to focus on the most common repairs because I'm looking for, um, I'm looking to, when I make content, to make enough content that overlaps on this common issues so that everyone who may happen by a video sees the aha, right? Um, you, you, you know, I used to not think that way. You know, I used to think like, oh, I made a video and it's got like 700,000 views. And so everybody who probably knows how to wants to fix this thing probably saw that video or somebody else's video. And I realize every day I see it in the comments like, wow, I never knew that's how you fix that or thanks for that suggestion or whatever. So that's why I do that. Um, let's see. Hi, Desert Hoodad says the black guitar with stripes. On schedule for shipping mid-May, anticipation. So he's talking about the uh, the Blackstock guitar right there. Absolutely. Um, my understanding, I didn't even know. 
I didn't even know. I, where did I see it? I saw it on the bad, the Blackstock Instagram. Um, it's my fault. They were probably giving me updates. And I, again, I was really busy this week. Um, but I saw that they had posted uh, the next being done and that they are on schedule. They might be slightly ahead of schedule and I might be getting in trouble for saying that. So please don't think that your guitar is coming sooner than what was told to you. But it is definitely on schedule. A couple weeks ago, I think I mentioned on a show they might be uh, not behind schedule, but like I said, it won't be ahead of schedule. It'll be at, you know, at the later thing, but I think they're actually on schedule or a little ahead. It just depends, right? There's a lot of steps, but you can see the updates if you go to Black's, uh, Black's if you go to Badlands uh, Instagram page or Facebook page, uh, they posted it. Um, in fact, there was really something cool uh, that they posted uh, with the next the other day that if you're paying attention, uh, if you're paying attention, it doesn't matter if you uh, got a guitar or not, or interested in one or not. Uh, if you go and look at that uh, neck being made, that neck, if you if you just look at it, I don't even have to explain it. If you just look at the neck being made, that neck, looking at it, tells you why you'll never have fret sprout on that guitar. There's three things going on to that guitar that's not guaranteed. There's no such thing a guarantee. But it's extremely unlikely that you'll ever experience a fret sprout issue with a Badlands guitar because of those construction methods. Not not anything unique to us, by the way. These are methods used by tons of shops around the world. It's just, again, we cherry picked all the best stuff. Like, okay, that's a great way to do that. Let's do that. That's a great way to do this. Again, it, it's uh, when you collectively have a 2,000 guitar reviews under your belt uh, where you dissect guitars and go through them, it's really easy to go, yeah, this is the way to go with this. This is the way to not go with that. So, all right. Uh, okay, let's see. Okay, I'm just looking for some questions. I'm going to jump on some um, super chats, but I want to actually see if there's any, what you guys are talking about. Benjamin wants to know any chance of me doing the review of the PRS uh, HD RX 20 watt. I'm going to say no. Uh, they didn't. They didn't choose to send one out for review, and uh, and now at this point, I'm almost not doing a lot of. Uh, if you notice, there's a change in the content, and that change in the content has been extremely successful for us. And uh, I'm not going to tell you what that is. <laughs> If you want to watch the last 10 videos, I think it's very apparent what we've been doing. And uh, and you can, and it's uh, very apparent if you look what the success has been. It's been night and day success for us, changing a few things in the strategy of what we do. And it's really just more catering to you guys. Okay. All right. Um, let's do a... Let's grab this question. This question comes from T-Sized, who says, Hello, Phil. Happy Friday. I'm looking at trading one of my guitars, and someone offered me a Fender made in Mexico, Cabronita. Uh, I always mess that out. I always want to say Carbonita, <laughs> but it's I think it's Cabronita. I'm still probably butchering it. But the Cabronita Telly. It has new tuners, new TV Jones pickups, and Trim King, Trim King Bridge. Never heard of a Cabronita. Are they any good? I absolutely love the Cabernetas. When they came out, they were first, I think it was a custom shop, uh, USA guitar. And then they, I think they did some, a small production run of USA Cabernetas. And then they did some, I think they did some Squires. They definitely did some Made in Mexico's. I always love the idea. Let's let's share it with the folks, shall we, with what it looks like. Um, what I'm really curious is if I just type in yeah, it comes up if I just hit that. So let's uh let's open one up. Oh, okay. So here's a custom shop. This I'm gonna share a custom shop with you if you don't mind. Um, this is how I remember them starting out as the Cabernet. Hey, ten percent off. Where at Chicago Music Exchange? Um, so uh, here's a used one. This is relict. So the ones I've all seen are been like this. It has this kind of cool pick guard on it. It's usually some kind of TV Jones or Filtertron pickups. Obviously, it looks like they upgraders to TV Jones. Um. And then one knob, one three-way switch. I mean, everything to love. Uh, I'm all about it. Um, it's one of those guitars. I try to add one. I try to buy one personally, and it just never came across the, the one I want. As you know, it's like everything has to line up. It has to be the color I want. It has to be the weight. 
you know, I don't want it too heavy. I put all these kind of restrictions on what a guitar has to be for me really kind of slows the process down to get a guitar and it slows the process down to want to get rid of a guitar because each guitar, when you go through so much, so many, um, things that you want to make sure the guitar is, you know, the way you want it, it's really, you know, hard to get rid of it. Um, so I don't know what you're asking since I'm looking at the trade. I don't know what you're trading, so I, I can't tell you if the trade is fair. What I can't tell you, the guitar is cool. So it's a guitar I would want, or I do want. Like I said, I love that Cabernita uh, guitar. So there you go. Vimps69 says, hey, happy Friday, Phil and KYG crew. Just wanted to pass along some good cheer. Thanks for all you do to the community. I appreciate that, Vimps. That was really nice of you. Uh, Octopus Ear says, Phil, I asked you last week about a, what guitar to get. And now I have another Kiesel on order. I was able to get in on the Easter sale and save 900 bucks. Yeah. I, I always look for those, uh, with Kiesel cause, um, you know, they can add up those little, uh, all those little kind of picks that you pick add up real fast. So sometimes when they cut, they kind of give you the free, free, uh, add-ons, that's a really good deal. However, I was going to tell you, so funny that you mentioned that is, um, I was thinking about this, uh, you know, I was told by a friend that if you get a Kiesel, they get addicting. And, um, one time I was talking to Brandon at Kiesel and I said, you know, it's really weird because sure. When you get a Strat, you kind of want another one. You get a Les Paul, you want another one. Sure. If you get any kind of guitar, you may want another one. I said, but it's weird with Kiesel. Cause it's kind of like you dream of a guitar, you get it. And it's such an exhilaration to see what you thought of comes to, you know, comes to reality and you get it and you might have a, you know, a, you might have a, uh, a moment where you're not excited about it. Cause it's not exactly what you thought, or you might have a moment where you thought it was perfect. Either way, it's like, you want to kind of relive it or try it again. It's almost like gambling, like custom building, a, a you know, dr dr dreaming of a guitar and then having it built and sent to you. It's it kind of like that. I would imagine it's the same rush as gambling. Like, did it work out? Oh, it did. I got to do it again. And so it's addicting. And, um, I said, I said, did you see that a lot? And they said, they see that absolutely a lot that, that that's why they advertise the way they do is because they know like once they hook somebody, so to speak, I'm, I'm using my terminology. So, you know, um, you know, once they get one of us, it's like, we're, we're going to get a bunch of guitars. They said that they have, uh, some customers that buy like over a hundred of them. I was like, what? That actually hurt my brain to do the math. I was like a hundred times. Let's see the cheapest one you can get. It's $1,500. I was like, all right, that guy's uh, either doing well or flipping a lot of guitars. <laughs> so, um, so, so yeah, so I'm, I understand the second uh, guitar. Um, Antique rocker says basses. Uh, he's talking about six string. So he's talking about artists, but I just want to talk about the basses: six string, eight string, 12 string. What's your take on each? Uh, I've never, I've never owned a 12 string bass. I probably picked one up once and played it for a second. There has to be one somewhere in my, my travels that I must've picked up an eight string I've owned. Uh, and so you guys know, so, so we're very clear when we say eight string and 12 string, we're not talking like guitars, eight string and 12 string where it's just in a row. These are like a 12 string acoustic. Um, they're, uh, you know, octaves, they're doubled up. So uh, an eight string bass is going to be like a four string, just it has four small strings that are octave up from the four normal strings. And then the 12 string is, I, I, you know, I think two, right? It's the same. I think it's the same two. I think it's two strings that are both an octave, but there's just twice as many of them, something like that. Um, I'm a huge Kings X fan. So as you guys know, Doug Pennick is, is like, man, he's, he's an idol to me in every way. So obviously the eight string bass. Oh yes. Right. I mean, it's just fantastic. So I bought an eight string bass. And I really was convinced I was going to do something. I was going to make some, something cool with this and make some music with it and do something. And I got it. I played uh, Jeremy by uh, Pearl Jam about 600 times that afternoon, uh, which is the intro to Jeremy, Jeremy uh, from Pearl Jam. If you guys don't know what I'm talking about that, I'm sure you some, but just Google it and just listen to the intro of that song. The first thing you hear, the very first thing you hear, that's an A string bass. Um, and then I played some King's X songs that I could play and, uh, you know, and then I just, it just sat. <laughs> so it's kind of like, and so to give you this answer sucks. Cause I hate this. This is the boring answers I have for you. Um, uh, eight string and 12 string bass to me is like a baritone guitar for me, which is 
Uh, very cool, but I don't own one because it's not something I practically will make music with. And as much as some of these guitars are just, you know, I'm collecting a guitar because I want, always wanted it and I have it and it's, I pull it off and like a piece of art I can use and pull it off the wall and play for a few minutes, maybe enjoy it for a minute. The majority of the guitars that I own have a purpose for me. They, they, I'm doing, I'm making music, even if that music's for myself, I'm doing something with these guitars. And so, like I said, I went down that road many years ago of, I'm going to have every kind of instrument you can think of. And I'd have a, you know, mandolin and I had a, I had a, a ganjo or a banjo guitar, whatever you want to call it, but it was a six string banjo. I had that. I had, uh, you know, baritone guitars. I had, you know, eight string bass. I would have all this stuff, upright bass. I'd have 12 string guitars. And what I found was, and in my mind, it was kind of like in my mind, buying all this stuff, I was going to be like the Beatles and experimenting and trying new sounds and things. And instead what happened was I spent more time dorking around with those things, not really accomplish anything for me. It's just, I'm telling you what happened with me. And the other half of the time, uh, I found myself not drawing the inspiration I was hoping to draw from them. And, um, and that's just what happened. And so I just stopped and that's why I mostly stick with the boring stuff, but don't let that, don't let that story discourage you from doing that. That was my journey. That's where I ended with. But what's great about that is I would love to say like, what a waste of time and money and don't do it. I would never say that. What I will say is it cemented what I believe and what I find inspirational now, right? Now I love, um, I always thought a baritone guitar would be cool for me. Instead, for some reason, I found the seven string guitar was just cooler for me. There was just something about that guitar. The idea that it's kind of like the baritone, but also not a baritone because it's tuned, you know, like a normal guitar, just with a low B, I found more useful for me, for me personally, uh, you know, more so than, uh, you know, a, a, a six string banjo. I just found playing the guitar, like the telly with the pick more towards the bridge and just, you know, hitting that note harder and brighter really gave it a sound that I go, I'll make that work. I've learned to manipulate it. Um, uh, you know, it's kind of like the theory of some people are talented and can play multiple instruments, a piano, a drums, a guitar, bass, you know, what have you. And some musicians really just kind of learn to master their craft of one instrument. In other words, uh, do the one instrument, but do it, you know, try to get it to sound like a piano, try to get their guitar to sound like a bass, try to get their guitar to, I mean, think of this, as you guys know, a lot of you might know I'm a bass player, but even as a bass player, a lot of times when I'm writing music, when I'm working on stuff, ideas, um, even when I need a bass line, I don't actually put the guitar down a lot of times. So if I'm playing the guitar and I go, oh, I need a bass line. I don't put it down and grab a bass. I just literally down tune the, ba the, the, uh, the, um, the low E to a B and try to manipulate that. Or I'll use an octave pedal or something. Um, and I'll use that either way. I just kind of, I just want to keep going. To me, uh, Tim, Tim Pierce gave me this advice, and so did um, uh, Warren Hewitt, who, who said both had fantastic advice, which is keep the momentum going. And uh, I found that is exactly the, the thing for me, is uh, when I'm inspired. And some of you guys may ask, what do I mean by that? Well, some of it is because, like I said, I'm, I've been writing some music for an instrumental album for my YouTube channel. But also, you have to understand, even though I just do review demos, you got to understand, like, you have to play something that somehow gets somebody to feel something, you know, right? Or, you know, and, um, you know, sometimes I sit there for, I hate to admit this because I really don't think the results show the effort. This is definitely a, you know, a sad thing to say, but it's true. I feel like sometimes I'll, you know, what you hear in a few minutes of me playing in a demo of a review, if you think it's okay, if you think it's good, if you think it's bad, just understand, I'm embarrassed to say this, but that was probably the result of hours of like, what could I play? <laughs> Especially when I'm trying to figure out what can I play that will be interesting for somebody to hear this instrument do and not be a copyright strike on YouTube and right demonstrate, you know, so, um, so there, so there you go. I'm just saying, so, uh, to answer your question, that's what, how I feel about those instruments. I think, I think it's worth a try. Um, if you can, do it, which is why sometimes we, we talk about inexpensive instruments like Harley Benton and stuff. And one thing that we forget sometimes, uh, as you know, is, is that they have a very necessary purpose besides the fact that they're just, you know, more affordable, they are obtainable to try new things, right? 
I don't necessarily think you should go out and buy yourself the most expensive baritone, but if there's an affordable baritone on the market, it's really, it's really cool, right? It's a really cool thing to do. My first seven string guitar I ever got, I would have never got a seven string. It would have never happened. The first seven string I ever wanted was the Steve I universe. I remember seeing it. It was, uh, I feel like it was 1990, 91. I don't remember when they came out, but I remember it was close. It was in guitar. This is just, I'm just sharing this, please. This is my actual um, Wayne's World moment. I walked into guitars, etc. Tucson, Arizona on Speedway. And I walked in there and there was a Steve I universe on the wall. It was $1,000. That's actually comical now to think that that guitar was $1,000 brand new. At the time, that price tag it, it looked like it said $10 million. It was like, this guitar is $10 million. And I was like, that's guitar is $10 million. That's what $1,000 meant to me in 1990, 91. It meant um, a $10 million, not even a million dollars. So I'm not even joking about million dollars. It was million dollars untainable. $10 million is just off the charts. A thousand dollar guitar was just so unobtainable. It wasn't even funny. And uh, I walked in, I saw it, and I just thought it was one of the coolest things ever. And it had one extra string and and every salesman in the store acted like it was like this most special thing on the wall. So to me, it was special, right? Because I'm like looking at it as like a kid kind of thing going, wow, this is so special. And um, and that was it. And then corn broke out a few years later. And then you saw more seven strings and there was uh, Limp Bizkit and all that stuff. But my point to the story was I would have never got a seven string except for Conklin uh, instruments, which made high end expensive basses and some guitars. Conklin made a deal with court, uh, guitars to make a seven string guitar. And it didn't do well because after the limp, you know, limp biscuit was like the jump, the shark. And I'm, I'm not dogging on limp biscuit. Um, uh, limp biscuit was like the jump, the shark of the seven strings, right? It was like, it was like corn. And then you had, um, the deft tones. Uh, don't get, don't get me wrong. There was morbid angel. I mean, there's tons of people. Oh man, don't forget awake by, uh, by Dream Theater, but there was all these seven string guitars. They were, they were, became, all of a sudden they were everywhere. And, um, and still not obtainable to me. But what happened was one day I walked into music go round and they had a court de built Conklin seven string on blowout. I mean, it was blowout. Uh, so, you know, 250 bucks, brand new <laughs> made in Korea. Right. Uh, and I bought it on either trade and layaway. So, you know, just to give you a reference to that. And, uh, loved it and been a seven string guy ever since I have to have a seven string. I find total use for it. So I don't know why a seven string to me is more useful than a 12 string bass or an eight string bass or a baritone guitar. It just is, uh, it's not because of the chunk of chunk of stuff, which is also fun. It's just, for some reason, it just connects with me. And that's what I kind of feel now is, and that's why I said, try new instruments, try other things too. Don't be afraid to try them. But also if you want my two cents. Also recognize that, you know, if it's not helping, it's a, it's a distraction and that distraction can be actually be worse than, you know, anything else. So Sean says Deftones is popular again. I don't think Deftones ever became not popular in my opinion, but yes, I think they're popular. Yeah. Yes. I love Deftones. So, 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 you know, just to be clear, all the bands I just mentioned in that, including Limp Bizkit, I still like. You can hate me all you want. It's okay. And I know Limp Bizkit is kind of like Nickelback and it gets the torture, but in, in my mind, it's, you know, I enjoyed it at the time. Okay. I, how weird. My little screen changed, threw me off. Um, okay. GM. It says, hey, good weekend, Phil. Just saying hi and hi to all. Still looking for a telly. Hopefully I'll find one too. soon. Thoughts on uh, Guitar Center having trouble again. So that I'm sure is uh, he's talking about the fact that Guitar Center um, is uh, first got downgraded, right? This is a big deal. They got downgraded again by Moody's. I think they're a junk, right? <laughs> they got downgraded to junk. It's just funny that they even exist. Junk. It's, it means don't invest. It means they're high risk. Don't mess with them. Um, look, it, that in itself, Guitar Center is the Jason Voorhees of our industry, right? It, it's like every time you think it's dead, it's back again for the sequel. This time, <laughs> right? This time, even more 
beat up, even more destroyed, but just keeps going and going and going. And, and I, I, you know, Hey, I appreciate that, uh, about them. I mean, Hey, they're, they're in it to there's, they're, they're holding on. Um, but specifically now having their, you know, their, their rating downgraded after a bankruptcy. I mean, it's tough to me. It's like, look, they just got a bankruptcy, which means they're starting fresh. Then they had a boom, a record boom. It's the record sales of guitar sales in history. And that's not just guitar sales. It was DJ equipment, all that stuff, right? The only category um, that's that seemed to me that probably got hurt during COVID was PA systems. But I, Sammy Ash told me that, that PAs were booming for them. Uh, he said that personally. So I was like, oh, okay, right? And I was shocked. I was like, I figured nobody's going outside. You know, you couldn't even go to church, remember, during to parts of COVID. So I'm like, oh, maybe they didn't need PAs. So the fact that they... The fact that they just had a boom and that they're in trouble, but I don't know what in trouble means. Okay. So that's where it gets a little tricky. Um, um, I understand that they're being downgraded and they're, they're a high risk to invest in. Um, you gotta understand the part of the problem for guitar center. And I say this because I want to be clear, cause it's not a guitar center problem per se. It's a retail problem is there's not a whole lot of growth in the box retail business. Um, there's a thousand of you hanging out every Friday watching me on the internet. All around me and below me are links to take you to all kinds of affiliates that will have you spending money. Um, a lot of you, if I mention a product, I'm just talking about this environment. We mention a product or you see a product behind me. You don't have to wait till tomorrow. You're like, when I get up, I'm going to go down to Guitar Center and I'm going to see if they got any P90SGs. Right now in real time, you can be looking to see who's got a dual P90SG in stock and who's going to give you the best price and which one's the one you want. And, and so because of that, the retail, physical retail market has, is, is, it's hindered obviously from that. And let's be very clear. There are, a ton of businesses that are going direct to consumer. As you guys know, I'm a small part of a guitar company now. And look, we didn't even discuss going to retail, right? Uh, it wasn't even like a, oh, and then we'll sell them in retail. So, you know, there was no concept for doing that. In fact, it is impossible to do that for us because one of the things that we would have had to have done to be in retail successfully is build in a margin for retail. We have no margin for retail on our price points. There's nowhere that if we were to go to a retailer and say, Hey, you want to carry our guitars? There's no way to pay them anything. They'd be like, yeah, you want to make 5% on a guitar? They would laugh. Right. Um, because of the fact that there's no margin in there. So retail, so we would have had to have thought of that going in going, Hey, if we want retailers, we, uh, we'll have to build a margin, but we want a direct to consumer business model. I really believe in the direct to consumer business model. I also wholeheartedly believe in the retail business model too. They coexist for me. So for instance, like I think I could flip side, it's a great story. You should go check it out. He's got a great online presence. You should check it out. Uh, I like Wildwood guitars, check out their, you know, stuff. There's, there's a lot of stores that I like and you can go physically there or you can check them all on their websites. That being said, <laughs> um, if any of those guys were not building their website presence as fast or as strong as their as their physical presence, I would say they're probably making a huge mistake. Because again, it's not about the retail environment dying and going away. It's about it's just no growth there. Again, how many good stores can Guitar Center keep opening? You know, um, think about this, and and uh, and uh, this is just to to talk about the Guitar Center thing. There's a. Um, there's a, something that happened. I, I think I shared the story before. I'm going to share it one more time. Just so you guys know, it was really how I had the epiphany about Guitar Center and the future of kind of retail for me. This is just something to think about for me. Um, my wife uh, decided we were going to go visit some family. We we're going to uh, uh, Moab in Utah. Okay. Uh, Moab is a place it's in Utah. <laughs> so anyways, um, I, of course, uh, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a workaholic. Uh, I'm just going to say it. It's true. I work every day, seven days a week. Uh, my, to me, taking a day off is a half day. Okay. Um, 
so that being said, I do a lot of stuff where we go on trips like that. Like literally the morning we get to go, I'm like packing and thinking about where to go. And so I was doing that stuff and my wife's like, you didn't pack. And I'm like, no, I'm packing right now to go. We're like we're leaving in an hour. I'm like, I'm getting ready. Like the first time. And, and I said to her sarcastically, she's like, you, you know, you really should have planned and packed ahead of time. And I said, well, when we get there, if I'm missing anything, I'll just go to Walmart and get it. Like, so if I forget something, I'll just go and pick it up at, a, at, the, at the Walmart. We got to Moab. I did forget something. It was shaving cream of all things. <laughs> okay. And, uh, there's no Walmart. And I was like, what? How is there no Walmart? There's no Target. There's no nothing. There was two, uh, mom and pop stores, grocery stores, and they were both closed. W one was closing. One was closed. When we got there. So, I mean, we'll have to wait till tomorrow, but I won't have anything to shave the next, in the morning. And, um, Anyways, I was shocked. I mean, it's a small town. If you've been to Moab, you guys know it's like 12 miles across the whole city, right? It's 12 miles and it's just one road, uh, you know, whatever. And uh, I was shocked. I was like, wow, I can't believe Walmart's not here. And I go, well, I bet you it's coming. And then the next day, uh, after I went to the mom and pop store, got my um, shaving cream stuff, what I noticed all day was Amazon vans everywhere, everywhere. We stayed at an Airbnb. We were in a neighborhood. Amazon vans were coming all day in that neighborhood to the point where I was like, oh, I can just get something sent to the house, right? <laughs> From Amazon. My point is, I'm not saying this is a fact because I don't know it's a fact, but here's a realization. You know why Walmart's going to have trouble building a store there ton of, based on a ton of reasons or a Target is? Those people don't need a Target at Walmart. They got Amazon trucks all day. And I'm not picking, so you guys, so everybody has like an opinion of how evil those companies are. We're not talking about that. We're just talking about a function of business in that function of business, right? So same thing. Do you need a guitar center in your town when you can get strings in three hours? You can get a guitar in a day, you know, see what I'm saying? So the problem with guitar center, in my opinion, is why they're probably still in trouble and why they'll continue to be in trouble is, um, they don't have any real strategy to make this work. Um, and they gave away to me in their, in my opinion, they gave away their biggest asset right away, which was musician's friend to me. Musician's friend was online before Sweetwater took over online marketing. You know what I mean? Before it became the big online presence and they kind of blew that off. And like I said, and so, um, to answer your question, what do we think about the guitar centers? Uh, I don't, I don't know what to say about their downgraded, uh, uh, you know, being downgraded to junk. I just know that their business model, it really focuses on you needing to go in the store. And most of the time you go in there, they don't have what you need, what you want. And it's because we've all changed as people going in there and seeing six strats is not impressive anymore when every strat is online. And for those of you, like I still have to physically touch it. That's why they still exist. And as long as that lasts, however, I will say you some, I will tell you guys all something I said in 2006. Okay. In 2006, obviously I had my store in 2005. I opened my store, but in 2006, I had my store and somebody said, are you going to have a website? And I said, no, because we didn't have a website for years because I didn't want to do business online. I wanted to, I wanted people to come in my store and talk to them and, and have a, have a moment with another you know, guitar player and, you know, have an experience. And, uh, somebody said, oh, you don't do the internet. Cause I like, uh, I, they said, I agree with you about not doing guitars on the internet. I could never buy a guitar on the internet. I don't know how anyone does it. That's what they said to me. This is 2006. My response to them was, well, no, I don't sell online because I, I just don't want to be, I don't want to pack and ship guitars all day <laughs> for a living. I want to hang out with guitars and work on them and talk to people. I said, but, so that's not why I'm doing it. And I said, to answer your question, you're absolutely right. Although I want to mention one thing, people find their wife online and their husband online. I don't think a guitar is a far fresh thing. <laughs> so it says, I can't believe anybody can find a guitar. Really? You think you can find a wife or a husband, but you can find a guitar. I, to me, that logic doesn't read with me. I, I get, I get where you're coming from, but as a, as a jump conclusion for people, I think people buying guitars as a personal thing online is, uh, not that hard of a, of a, of a, of a reach when people are dating and finding their loved ones <laughs> right online. So, uh, I still think it's funny. People are like, hey, maybe people buy cars online. I'm like, really? Everybody's still, nothing really escapes me past the whole, really, you can find a, a husband or a wife 
and that's not shocking, but you can not buy a guitar or a car. Um, so there you go. I don't have any more information on the guitar center thing other than that, other than, you know, what I always say, which is they're Jason Voorhees. I don't think they're going to go anywhere, but I don't think they're going to grow. Uh, uh, hopefully they'll, I don't know, level out. Who knows? Or maybe the mom and pop should take over again. That's right. Actually, that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see all the mom and pops just put the guitar centers out of business. That might be some poetic judge justice for all the mom and pops guitar center put out of the business and then basically bankrupted and collapsed anyways. I mean, there's some poetic justice there. Um, Grumpy Mike Guitar said, just curious if there's any hints about when future bandland models might be released. Cheers. Interesting, interesting Grumpy Guitar, uh, Grumpy Mike Guitar. Obviously, super chatting in that, so I have to answer it. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, the answer is super simple. Um, uh, I've said it before. I'll just reaffirm it one more time, and, and I won't try to be as vague, but um, I'll, it's just the honest truth. The next Badlands guitar model, which has already been done, okay? They've all been done. We're, like I said, we are successful with our models all the way until 2025. And what I mean by that is we already know what's coming, when it's coming, what it's going to look like, all that stuff, right? We already have it in motion. The, the only thing we don't know, we personally, the group, doesn't know is when they physically release. So here's what I will tell you. We, they release, the next model releases 14 days, I'll say 15 days, 15 days after all 50 people who bought a red line are happy which is they were, they received 10, I think they get 10 days after. See, we didn't do the, you custom order it and you're stuck with it rule. We did the, you have 10 days to try the guitar and make sure that it's right for you. And it's, it's a, a good guitar, right? You want it. And so we know that's a high risk. Uh, look, a lot of companies don't do that. No one's going to build a custom guitar you know, and go, Oh, you know, you don't like it. Oh, too bad. Lump it. Um, we, we just don't feel that's the right thing to do. Right. So we felt like, Hey, um, if you buy the guitar, in fact, so, you know, you can't, you can't back out of it. So it, cause you put a deposit. So if somebody puts a deposit on a red line, they, they bought it, they're getting it. Um, there's no way out of getting it, but once they get it, if they don't like it. And so, you know, that's more expensive. It'd be a lot cheaper for us to cancel their order and not send them one. But we're basically saying, Hey, um, if you get, when you get the guitar, if you don't like it, you can return it. So 10, they have 10 days. So 15 days, about five days, that's about a grace period, five days after we uh, know all 50 guitars that were sold, they are happy with them. And that's important. The way I'm saying that is, when I'm saying that is not just because the 10 day, you know, you have 10 days return it expired and you're like, haha, you're stuck with it. Now let's release a new guitar. That's not our attitude. Our attitude is, we, we don't want any open, let's say open cases. Uh, in other words, like somebody's like, I got it, but I got shipping damage or I got it. And I didn't know it was going to be red, <laughs> whatever it is, whatever we're dealing with, we're not going to open a new, the new run of guitars until we resolve everything with the first run of guitars. We don't want, you know, we don't want to have open issues. So that's what I'm basically saying. So the reason I say it that way is I can tell you what we want. We want the new model to launch June 1st. That's what we want. That's ideal for us. The new model announced on June 1st. Will it get, I have no idea, but it, it's all what, when it will get re released is once all 50 customers are happy and we're ready to release and we release it and we just release it. We can release it now. <laughs> we just don't have all 50 customers happy yet. So, so there you go. Um, that's the answer. But at least you got a good answer. Our new something new, which is June first, is that it was is a dream target, not likely. We think it's going to be mid to late June is when we think the next model comes out. That's when we think, based on when we think they get shipped out, when people receive them, you know, some time to to discuss anything if there's any issues or whatever. So and then go on. So that's the way we did it. And again, everything we're doing is because we analyzed the way other companies did it. We saw what they did right. We saw what they did wrong, the mistakes they made that we felt they made as guitar players, as you, as dudes who just love guitar and, and do debts, I guess. And, um, and, um, uh, that's why we did it. That's why we won't ever do an import line of instruments from Badlands. There won't be an actual affordable import line of this brand. Um, if some of that bums you out, 
There's probably some other cool news that are coming that will make you happy, but it won't be import lines from us. And we'll never do a signature guitar. Now I'm not, again, I'm a minority partner in this, so I don't have control of those answers. So those answers could change. I'm just telling you what my vote will be. And right now everybody's kind of voting the same, which is those are not two things we're interested in because all of those things all lose focus from what we wanted, which is this cool custom guitar that was on a group buy-in. Uh, see, I hate, I love and hate this, by the way. So you guys know, I don't want ever, ever the, the Badlands to take over the show, but I understand these are interesting questions sometimes. Super League 100 says, are all the Badlands guitars going to be a bolt-on, bolt-on on an S-style guitars? Um, no. I can't remember, and I'm being just truthful here. I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to be vague on a vague purpose. I can't remember what number it is. I'm trying to think. Could it be number six? Let's just say number six, but I think it might be five. Um, number six is uh, not a bolt-on. So yeah, they change. They're different models. Like I said, this has all been a pre-planned system of what we're going to do going forward, why why they come the way they are, what they are. But yes, there's eventually ones that are. Um, so the answer is yes to your two questions. There is a neck through and there is a non-strat you know, style instrument. Yes. But when they get released, that's like I said, they're in order. I just can't remember the order. I only focused on the next one. <laughs> I, my, my focus, my, 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 one of my main roles in this is, uh, the quality assurance and making sure the customers are happy. So I'm, my focus is on the 50 of these, right? Cause once I got 50 happy people, then I'm done. Then I don't have to, you know, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like focused on. We're all focused on it too, but I mean, it's my kind of my thing. And then obviously releasing the next one and worrying about that group of customers is my problem as my, is my daily job to worry about. So, all right. Um, okay. Yeah. Now you guys are all going to guess you guys, please have fun guessing and stuff. I mean, it's by all means, it's fun. You never know. Um, double speak says part one, part one. Hi, Phil. I had recently had a return a Charvel due to a twisted neck. Oh, the frets were not level around the seventh due to a twist and it had dead notes as a result. Okay. That's part one. Part two. I now have a replacement guitar and it's, and it has no dead notes or any fret buzz. Action is an acceptable height. However, part three, I checked the frets with the rocker and the frets are not level. After 12 fret in a few spots, after the 12 fret in a few spots, I am overly concerned about uneven frets. What are causing the issue? Okay, so first, this is why um, when I do the deep dive stuff, the geeky sections, I, I try to variate the how I test the frets uh, for you guys. And um, it is a lot easier for me as a creator of video content to do the rocker every time because it's, it's a one shot on the camera and I just do the rocker and that's simple, easy. Um, it's a lot harder to do where I play the notes, right? You guys know sometimes in the videos, I just play each note all the way up the fretboard. It's a little harder because to do that, I have to stop where I am in the geeky stuff video section of the shop downstairs, come upstairs, make sure the camera's set up here and do the video up here, that piece here too. But I want to vary it and do it that way. The reason is, is because I want you to see, and I want you to constantly understand that, um, the fret rocker is kind of like, it's a tool, it's a diagnostic tool that does exactly what it's supposed to do. It's going to find a problem, a mistake, a mistake. Now, that doesn't always translate. So in other words, you might have the fret rocker say this fret's a little high, and then you play it and you can't hear anything. There's no problems. So understand that your ear is your quality assurance department, is the final say-so of whether or not something is good or not. Don't, don't, so like I said, I, I try to say it, I'll, I'll make sure because of this, I'll keep trying to reinforce it, which is what I really think you should focus on as players who are working on your guitars is when you detect an issue, in other words, when you're playing something and something buzzes or it's dead or it's, you know, the note isn't, isn't ringing out, whatever the problem is, then you get those diagnostic tools, which are pretty basic tools like the fret rocker, and then find out exactly where that problem is. And then you can address it. And I've shown, you know, I've shown you guys a hundred different ways to do something, but you get the idea and that's how you fix it. But keep in mind, 
um, you know, let me, let me put it this way. Sometimes I'll, I have a customer and they'll go, I say, is there any issues with fret sprout? You know, I'm asking issues and they go, no, it plays great. I just want to make sure you check it out. And then I find a couple of things. And in that I will address them, but sometimes I'm also cautious because they don't notice anything. So sometimes it's a follow-up for me, like, Hey, did you notice this? And they go, oh, yeah, I did notice that a little bit. I wasn't sure though. That was a problem. And then I fix it. Sometimes they say, yeah, I didn't notice it. And I'm like, well, let's leave it alone. Cause it's fine. Right. Just because, you know, the fret rocker says it's bad. So in your case, um, and, and, and also keep in mind, it's totally, uh, reasonable for you after you got a bad guitar with issues to be a little sensitive to the next guitar having issues. And it sounds like to me, what's happening with that guitar is it's having a few issues that are minor. Like you, like I said, you have a couple spots over the 12 fret that don't seem perfectly level. What I don't know, cause there's no information here in your context of, of your question is, and they're dead notes or they're not, you know, ringing true. Just, you've discovered these issues. Your concern, I'm reading what you said, your concern about uneven frets is that is that they're not causing an issue, right? So you're like, and I'm sure you're like, well, they're not causing an issue now, but what about the future? It's possible it could get worse. It's possible, um, but not likely. Uh, remember the instrument, the instrument needs to be built well. It needs to be finished well. However, there are just random things that happen with guitars. They are wood. It is a handcrafted thing. Even though we have CNC machines making them, a lot of hands are touching this stuff. It is your action. Like I, I said, I did the, um, I think the Boya and Zink, Zeke, Zichi guitar is what I'm going to say. I call it, I think everybody told me how they say it. Um, in that video, I, uh, I showed you how to tap down some frets. And in that video I explained, and it was pretty clear, I'm sure, uh, in the video that those notes at, at two millimeter action, uh, were not dead. There was no issues there. They were fine, but at lower action, they were, they were decaying. They weren't hold. they were buzzing out and dying. So, so that's the same thing with you. Your guitar may be fine with the, the action it's at. So it'll be all, all the way it is. Um, so I'm basically saying from what you're telling me, don't worry about it. But I want to just, instead of say, don't worry about it. I want to tell you why you shouldn't worry about it. Um, just pay attention to it. If it becomes a problem, you'll have to deal with it, but don't, I don't want you to think because you had a bad guitar before and a bad neck that it's, it's likely to happen again. It's very rare. Twisted necks are not very normal. The, what you had happens, but it doesn't happen in like one in five and one in 10. It happens in much bigger, uh, much less percentages than that. Even, even with inexpensive guitars. Um, <laughs> Battle Palifax, what's up, guys? It says, what is your favorite friendly pedal solid state amp that's still on production at this time? It's got to be the Katana, right? I don't know how you would beat that as a solid state amp. Um, for pedal platform amps, it's got it's it's that it's that's it. It's 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 one of those amps. It's <laughs> see, so I always think like sometimes when I say things, I'm always like, is this the thing that everyone's gonna kill me when I say? <laughs> Um, to me, the Katana is like a Toyota Corolla, <laughs> maybe a Camry. I don't know. Corolla. It's dependable. It's good. It's not sexy, but who cares? Right. But the reason I say that is because sometimes I feel like when I praise the Katana people are like, ah, I'm so sick of hearing about the Katana. Me too. But also if I don't point out the kind of Katana, people are like, how could you not mention the Katana? It's such a great little amp. So the answer, uh, pedal pal is the Katana to, to be honest with you. I don't know. I don't know what amps you could find that are at that price point that are better. Um, there are some digital modeling amps that I like and that do well, but I, th I think it's hard to beat the Katana 50 for me for a, just a practical, you know, just plug in the pedals and go. Um, there's, that's what you asked. Now, if you were to say like, like I said, I call them desktop amps. I, I like the Spark a lot, I, which is a modeling amp. And I like the Yamaha, uh, THR 30, but I think that's also a modeling amp as well. But I, I understand what you mean, you know, by solid state. So even they, to me, they qualify. Um, but as a, as a, as an amp, I think that's the way to go. So. Ah, oh, Sean says the rolling cube 80. Sure. Of course, all the rolling cubes, uh, Sean are great choices. I mean, essentially they're like the fathers of the, of the Katana. Um, 
So they, uh, yeah, see, and Deanna's saying, loved, I had the Katana, but never vibed with Love the Catalyst, which is the Line 6, which is what I reviewed, reviewed. And I said in that review, or maybe I didn't say in the review, but I'll say it now. If you gave me a choice between the Katana and the Catalyst by Line 6, I'd pick the Catalyst. But to to Pedal Pal, I, I'm assuming, because Pedal Pal makes Pedal Pal pedals, that you guys all know, because they make great pedals, they're asking because they he's probably looking at a solid state amp to throw some pedals in front of. I'll tell you on a side note, let me actually take the question to where you didn't take it to, um, guys. Uh, if I was you guys and I was building pedals, I would definitely run it through a katana. Like if I was in the if I was building pedals, without a doubt, I would have a katana and I would have a Fender Hot Rod Deluxe sitting right there to test every pedal through because right there you're going to capture 20 percent i'm just throwing a number of guests it's a guess number i obviously can't have actually know this information that well but i'm just this instinct tells me 20 percent of the market that's a huge part of the market right um to say hey look if you got those two if you try your pedal through those two amps and you like the way it sounds that's 20 percent minimum are going to be running them through those amps they'll sound pretty good so uh, so that's the way I would do it as well. Right. Um, those are the two amps. Yeah. Orange crush. I mean, granted there's tons of great solid state amps. Right. But, and, and like I said, I did the orange crush. I did the old one. Everybody told me the new one's better. Um, but I haven't tried it. <laughs> Patrick says, and the crate power block. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. I love it. Everybody's got like, I'd like to take a second. I, sometimes I don't get to read all your guys' comments. So I like reading them. Uh, Jennifer says, Hey, tried the Gibson, uh, 339 for the first time. I thought I felt surprisingly cheap. <laughs> yep. Uh, ha I have you had that experience used to fenders and the SG. Sure. I love that. By the way, that's amazing, Jennifer, that you said that. Um, I absolutely look, I, I, I totally get that. Let me, let me, my first experience with a Stratocaster was it was cheap. I, I just felt like a fender, an actual fender American Strat. <laughs> okay. I picked it up in the store and it's like, this feels cheap, <laughs> right? Like it was just like, this, you know, I was used to a Floyd Rose. I was used to like, what I felt was more robust type stuff. Um, same thing. The first time I picked up a hollow body guitar and a semi hollow body, I thought the same thing as you. I thought, Oh, this feels like cardboard turned into a guitar. And there, I just, uh, <laughs> right. It just didn't feel expensive to me. It felt cheap and it was more expensive. So I totally get that. I totally get that. Um, and you, and to this day, semi hollow guitars, more so than hollow bodies, semi hollow guitars, AS 335, 339 um, style guitars, those style, because they're highly copied, obviously, by everybody. Um, sound wise, it's not so much the sound I'm going for, it's the look, it's a vibe, right? There's a vibe to a 335, okay? Sound wise, sure. I've said this before. I, to me, the 339, 335 have a very Les Paul vibe. I don't. No, I've never tried. I don't know that if I plugged them in and, and, you know, sat in a room and had somebody play each the 339, 335 and a Les Paul in the room, if I could detect with my ear, any difference, um, in the sounds of those guitars, like, I, Oh, that's definitely hollow body. I mean, I probably could hear the hollow body in the room. So maybe I'd have to be out of the room listening to an amp or something. But my point is it's a vibe. It's a feel to it. There's something um, about that feel and vibe that makes you feel a little different. Just like a strap makes you feel different than a telly and a telly makes you feel different than like, you know, some kind of 80 shred metal guitar. There's different vibes to the instruments. Um, it's a lot of it's in our head and it's not really real, but it's in our head. So it's kind of real. Right. So I, I totally get that. Um, now when you say surprisingly cheap, that's how I interpret that. You could mean it because you, you know, the one you got was junky and they didn't do a good job putting it together. That's possible too. But I would say I've never picked up any Gibson, I'm just saying Gibson's not even Epiphone's. Let's just talk about Gibson's because this kind of hits at home. I've never picked up any Gibson 335 or 339, looked at it as someone who repairs guitars in detail and went, that's craftsmanship. 
<laughs> like there's nothing about it that goes, whoa. In fact, I can tell you, um, funny enough, I have a Paul Reed Smith uh, Hollow Body 2 uh, guitar, as you guys know, that was my COVID depression guitar is now what I refer to it, which how sad is that, uh, that I call it that. Uh, it's my, it's this, it was the guitar I spent a ton of money on during COVID and, you know, to fill the hole in my soul, so to speak. Um, and I always wanted one. I sold a bunch of them because I was a dealer for them, but I never actually had one. And the reason I want one is because the opposite to me, it is the most beautifully crafted instrument I've ever seen. It, it, you know, just looking inside of it as someone who works on instruments, just looking in there looked like, wow, so much attention to detail when you can't even see it. Who took that? You got to take a dip. Think of this to appreciate how well Paul Reese Smith makes the hollow body two of the USA ones. I'm not disparaging the SEs, but they're not on the same league as this. The SEs are on the same league as the Gibson stuff, which is a great league to be in. But when we talk about the hollow body two, when I'm talking about how great it is, I'm talking about the fact that I take a dental mirror and I put it in the F hole and I look inside there and I go, wow. <laughs> right? I, why I would even care, <laughs> right? Anyone would care that this thing inside. But to me, the fact that it's so beautiful inside that they took so much time to make it look perfect inside, uh, it makes me feel like probably how people who buy a Rolex feel. I don't know. I don't really know that, right? Or a fine, you know, sports car or whatever luxury things you're into. It's one of the few guitars that I feel like it's a luxury guitar. You get it and you go, this is like, you know, wow, <laughs> they did, they did all this stuff they didn't have to do. So other than that, and, and I say that because that guitar doesn't especially sound that great to me. The hollow body two is my probably least favorite sounding Paul Reed Smith. <laughs> like, so it's not because I bought it. Cause like, I just wanted the tone. I just wanted it because like I said, somebody, I just, something I always appreciated working on guitars. That was one of the guitars that always stuck out of my mind is like, wow, that's really over the top built really well. Plus the fact that it's carved, it's not a bent top and bottom. They're carved out of solid pieces of maple, which is again, different and cool. So, um, there you, there you go. So something to think about, um, on the 339 though, um, I really love it, but also maybe look at that PRS S, uh, SE hollow bodies. They're built the same way as the 339 and they're about the same, a little smaller, actually a little bit more comfortable. It's funny. It's funny that I, I have this thing where I really want a 339 again, but now that you kind of made me think about it, I'm like, yeah, why don't I look at the SE, uh, Paul's good, or, uh, semi hollows. They're really cool. I don't know. Um, uh, Litve said nothing. He just wanted to do a super chat. Litve, did you get a message to us about your certificate issue or whatever you were saying last week? If you did not, please send it to us at the, uh, uh, I think Shauna was looking for it. I think we're looking for your email. So please like forward it. If not, I will dive into the P McKnight seven and see if I can find it. But if you see what a mess that, that email address looks like right now, it's just, piles of emails. So I will, I will do my best. Um, also Derek, thank you for the super chat. Uh, I'm going to say Ross to law. I'm man. I'm going to jack up your name. I'm just going to call you Rost. Okay. Uh, Hey Phil, can you please recommend a small and portable practice amp mostly for clean sound? There are many small amps, but most of them sound bad. Sure. I mean, I can only tell you my favorites, man. They could be the ones you're actually talking about. Uh, for me, small amps don't, uh, micro cube by, by Roland, oh, fantastic product to get them used. And the new ones are good. I like the old ones better, but they're both really good. That's a very small amplifier to me. I can get any tone out of that. I need it's a very, it's a very, and it's practical for the price point. So now once you leave that price point, you're talking about small amps, obviously the spark's going to sound good. The Yamaha THA thirties are going to sound good especially on clean, they all do clean really well. You're using small. So those are all small amps. I don't know if you mean like smaller than a 110 inch speaker amp, but those are the amps I think of. Now, if you want to go a little bigger, my favorite, it's not a practice amp, but just to give you how warped my perspective is, uh, my favorite practice amp is my Princeton. So, I mean, that's a really kind of expensive amp to be calling a practice amp um, and it's tube, but it is why I like it. it is essentially the amp I would, I practice on um, the most cause it's small. So I keep kind of pointing at it. It's down there. It's underneath the, the, uh, the deluxe reverb. Um, I just realized you guys can't see it, but it's there. 
Um, but those are really good. Um, I reviewed the uh, New X, a little por portable amp. I still have that in my shop. I'm really impressed by the amp. I like that as much as the Spark and the THR30 in a different way. I couldn't say it sounds as good as those, but but for feature sets and it sounds good. So that's something I would check out too. Those are all good small uh, amps I would definitely check out that I, I've actually owned or, or currently own and I, I like. There's probably a ton of suggestions from everybody else. Unfortunately, I haven't tried everything so I can't suggest more than what I have have experience with. Um, Hanner, what's up, Hanner? I haven't seen you in a while. He said, hey, just saying hi, long time. Yeah, what's up? It's good to hear from you, man. Uh, Michael says, if you had $700, would I get a Sire L7, an Epi, or something else? Uh, looking for a growly single cut uh, if I if brand doesn't matter. So, okay, so I'm going to change that. I'm going to answer your question, but I just want to really kind of Put it as 700 bucks. I'm looking for a good single cut guitar. Let's start there. And since you picked up the Sire, you said the Sire and the Epiphone, obviously I'm not thinking of modern uh, single cuts. I'm trying to think of any other single cuts that I've tried that I was like $700-ish. No, it's, it's definitely the Sire. There's, I can, I could give you, well, before I say it and I get myself in trouble, I was going to say, I can give you 10 reasons why you should buy the Sire over the Epiphone. Um, but I'm going to give you two. I'll give you two reasons. One, I feel like that guitar was perfect. Um, it's not just the one I reviewed. Remember the one I reviewed I bought? That's even more powerful because as some of you guys are like, yeah, they picked your ringer. Well, I bought this one. Um, and I bought it from Chicago Music Exchange. So you guys know, I just bought it from on, on Reverb and bought it. Um, somebody said the Ert... Yeah, Ert would be up there too, for sure, for a single cut. For sure. Definitely still better than the Epiphone. Look, I really like Epiphone. It's a brand I highly recommend. You got to understand my problem now with Epiphone is my same problem kind of with Squire right now. Their price points are really not the same as what they used to be. They used to be more of like, a, oh, that's affordable. Now it doesn't feel like it's affordable stuff, right? It feels like it's affordable premium. I don't know what you would call that. It's just expensive stuff. Um, but like I said, the L7, and so perfect example, thank you for bringing up the ERT, by the way, uh, the ERT. Between the ERT, the Epiphone, and, and the Sire, what would I pick? I would pick the Sire. Um, I really, really love ERT guitars. I think they are nailing it. But you got to understand, for the things I care about, all the things that I focus on, I feel like the Sire is the way to go. It's just, it's just, that's, that's just the way I, I kind of feel about it. Um. In the long term, the Epiphone probably will hold the best value because it's a bigger brand name. It's more well-known, but I'm just talking about quality. And again, more, more what I would do, right? Um, not what you should do. <laughs> it's what would I do. If you gave me a choice between those three guitars and 700 bucks, because again, I know I could buy the E-Art and save some money, but I would still probably pick the Sire. It, it would definitely, and especially over the years, you know, reviewing as many guitars as I have, taking apart, looking at stuff and feeling them, I, I have to go off these memories sometimes of like, what did it feel like? What did I think of it? And here's what I can tell you about Sire that's nice about recommending them. Um, ERT's good, but I, in almost every ERT video you want to, whatever you want to call it, I found something that probably has to be addressed, right? And that's what I think about. I'm recommending this to you. What are you going to have to deal with? That's why I like to be so open about what I have to deal with in a, in, a, in a video when a guitar comes, because I, I don't want you to go, I got it. And this happened. I want you to go, I got it. And something else happened. And I go, well, at least you expected it to happen. The Sire stuff. I don't, I don't really ever remember like, oh no, this was horrible. I always feel like, man, this is like out of the box, ready to go. So yeah, um, I would go Sire. Mickey Mess says, go Shiji $700. I don't think Shiji has, they have a single cut, but I've never tried it. Shiji, Shiji, right? Uh, uh, but I've never, I've never tried their single cut. Okay. PW uh, says, "Hey, what about Sire's thin neck?" Yeah, 
that I'm not a fan of how narrow it is. It's not how thin it is. I'm okay with how thin it is. It's how narrow it is. I heard there's another version now that's got a wider nut. I'm not a fan of Sire's narrow nut on that. No, 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 no. It wasn't on the single cut. See? The, the, narrow, the narrow issue for me wasn't the single cut. It was the hollow body. The H7, not the L7. So the L7 was legit. I was fine with that. I, I, don't, I don't know why. If it was more narrow, it didn't bug me. But the H7, which I thought was a flawless, beautiful guitar, I just wasn't a huge fan of how narrow the nut was uh, overall. But that was my nitpick. That was my thing I was picking on. Uh, in Cortex says, hey, Phil, from Australia. Hey, what's up? Says, uh, <laughs> I'm just laughing. I watch a lot of videos from Australia. Uh, it's, uh, if, when I get time to watch those, uh, we call them repurposed TikToks because they're always, I watch on like Instagram or something. If I get to see those little videos, I watch nothing but these shark videos <laughs> they're always in Australia. So that's what, every time I hear Australia now, I'm like, yeah, where all the shark videos come from. Anyways, uh, we have to watch the rebroadcast. Okay. Uh, how do you best remove a, br a base bridge from a nitro finish? and not damage the finish. Oh, well, hopefully, uh, first of all, nothing should be causing the, in, the bridge to stick to the nitro. That's, you shouldn't have any issues. You should just undo the screws and it'll just fall off. That's about it. Um, that's it. I, if I was going to say anything, and this is the most extreme, um, the only thing you have to really do is make sure that the temperature is not too extremely cold or extremely hot. And extremely cold and extremely hot means exactly what you think it means. You know, if you're wearing winter gear, <laughs> right? Or if you're sweating so much, you're about to faint. It's maybe too hot or too cold to be yanking the bridge off. And that's just, I'm just being cautious, but there's no real reason. You can just, it'll just come off. It's no big deal. Uh, Warham, uh, uh, Chris, thank you for the super chat too as well. Warham says, hey, thoughts replacing a P90 with TV Jones. Will it fit? Um, I don't believe it fits. Um, can it fit? It can fit. I don't, well, I know it doesn't fit. I'm trying to, when I say it doesn't fit, I know the length of the, the TV Jones, the Filtertron is shorter in length. So if you stick it in a P90 hole, you're going to have two gaps on each side. So that's your biggest problem. I just, but what I don't remember is the width. And if the width is the same, so I don't even know if it'll fit width wide. It might be wider than a P90 and shorter, or it might be the same width as a P90. Um, but uh, it, it, it's off memory. I think it fits width wise, just it's too short. And I don't know if there's an adapter for that. Like if you're talking about a mini humbucker, you can take mini humbuckers and put them in P90 spots because they make adapters. So for instance, that came up as a question, by the way. Um, I'm going to try this in mini humbucker P90 adapter. So let me show you what I'm, what I'm talking about. So there is really, there's no better picture than that. They show you the adapter images. Here you go. Okay. Give it a second to think. Okay. So here's the Seymour Duncan Antiqu antiquity pickup. And this is a mini humbucker. This is what I was talking about. And it ha it's in a P90 housing. See this? So if we go back, we can go back here. And you can see them right here. See? Um, and there's all kinds of adapters. Oh, here's a TV Jones dog ear style pickup ring. So yeah, this will let you put a TV Jones in a dog ear. So there might be an adapter. So that's what you're looking for. So if you have P90s and you want to put a TV Jones. So let's try TV Jones. P90 adapter. Hmm. I'm not seeing it, but the idea, the fact that there was one for a dog ear makes me think it's possible, but I've never done it. No one's ever asked me to take and put a, a, fil uh, a filter Tron style pickup, which is what TV Jones is. No one's ever asked me to put a filter Tron in a P90 spot. Uh, I've had people say, Hey, I want to, I don't, you know, they don't want the P90. So we put mini humbuckers in there or you, DiMarzio has some humbuckers that are P90 shaped and you can drop in there. Um, but I've never had anybody ask. Um, I just, so far, all I see for the TV Jones is the dog ear style pickup ring. So I don't know if they actually have a P90 style adapter for it. Um, uh, 
Okay. How we let me refresh that. Okay. <laughs> My screen's going slow. All right. Let's see what you guys are talking about. Yeah, t Tony's saying you can have always have WD cut uh, music cut you special pickup mounts. Yeah, there's got to be a way to do it. I've just never, I've never had to do it. No one's ever asked me to do it. Filtertron is narrower and taller than a P90. Well, the height isn't really my concern. That you can route. Um, height is an easy thing to fix. Uh, it, it's really, and and being narrower is, is fine, but it's the height that's, uh, I mean, the, the having the gaps on the sides aesthetically is going to look like crap. All right. Okay. Do we have anything else? I'm just looking over your guys' comments. Thank you, Jackson. Jackson said, "I." I he says, we rock and he loves the show. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. I think we covered it. I think we hit all the subjects and all the questions. If you have anything else, I'm just looking real quick before I, I call it a show. Hmm. Uh, oh, uh, Vanilla Slice said it's snark time. We did the giveaway last week. I sent an email out. Let's see if anyone responded. I sent an email out to the winners. We're not giving away today because we're going to do a gig bag. But long story short, that didn't get done today. Um, sometimes when we get right up on the show, right before we launch the show. Let's see. Did anyone claim there? No one's claimed yet. So if you got an email today from me <laughs> to your actual email address says, Hey, this is Phil McKnight from New Year Gear. Oh yeah. So Steven. So Steven responded. So one, one is Steven, Steven one, a snark. Oh, it looks like, and Ginny. So two people, Ginny, uh, Jennifer won a snark and Steven won a snark. I don't know who the names of the winners are. One of the things about King Sumo, so you guys know, is um, the way it works is all we get is your email address. So I have no idea who I'm emailing. So that's why if it says, hi, it's me, and it doesn't say your name, it's because I don't know your name. <laughs> it doesn't give me that. It's just when King Sumo, uh, the service, when it randomly picks uh, people, it just randomly picks them and then displays them to me. I see them as an email address. I copy paste it into my, my, uh, you know, my email and then I just email you. So two of the people who have claimed them. So we'll make sure we do some more giveaways next week. That'll be perfect. And then we'll get these out this weekend for you guys. Um, so, uh, and then Amanda says, maybe a super chat got miss missed. Did we miss a super chat? Let me look. I don't see one that I missed. Hold on, I'm just double checking. If I do miss it, we'll scoop it up for next week, but I don't see one. Yep. Oh, Sean Brooks. Okay, Sean, sorry about that, buddy. Says, hey, I got a deluxe reverb in on trade. One of the power tubes is rattling, ordered a new EH tube. Should I hire a tech or bias it myself? Um, I'm somewhat handy. Uh, if you're somewhat handy, you can do it yourself. I mean, there's tons of great videos on how to do it. Obviously, you know, anytime you're putting your hands in the amps, the big thing is if you touch any of those capacitors, you could have a bad day. 
And, uh, and, uh, I, I don't want to make it sound light. Like I'm making fun of it, but it, it could be more than a bad day. Um, so obviously what I would say to you is, um, you understand that with a two amp, the two dangers are one, you could hurt yourself. That's why one, you got to sit on your one hand the entire time and make sure that you know what you're poking around at and doing. Um, and two, uh, you could damage the amp, right? You can actually hurt the amp if you don't do it correctly. So that being said, if that caution puts caution in you to do it, then maybe you shouldn't do it and you can have somebody do it. But if you think you can figure it out, you can figure it out. I will say this, uh, uh, fender amps are about the easiest to mess with for me. And I don't mess with amps. So, you know, it's not something see, that's like I said, I can't give advice on something. I'm just kind of telling you like my experiences with it. It's not, you know, I really don't like messing with amps myself for that reason. I know enough to not hurt myself which means stay out of it. Yeah. Trevor says, don't touch the capacitor kids. Yes. So, um, so there you go. Okay. All right. We did a good job. Um, I hope everybody had a good time. That was a good time. I think I'm going to show you guys, I'm going to do something. I just want to show you this. I don't know why we, um, I never really show you guys this kind of stuff. And I thought it would be a great way to end uh, the, the show. And, uh, and, uh, I'm going to share this with you. So we have a cat now we have dogs and a cat now. And, uh, our cat is hilarious, right? I know it's a cat story, but this is hilarious because he's like, we call him the, uh, like a desert desert Panther because he's always like out in the backyard, like hunting. It's like, we call him, it's, we call it practicing murder. We're like the cats outside practicing murder. Cause it's always looking for some, so my wife took some pictures and I just want to share one with you because I just love this picture. Um, and so when I say desert Panther, this is uh, hopefully to put some, some good holiday weekend cheer in your life. Here is our desert Panther kitty in the tree. This is him, uh, stalking something, doing something. I just love this picture. It just made me smile. I thought I'd share with you guys. That's what I thought it was a great way to end a show on a positive note. So there you go. That's my cat being cute, trying to kill something, <laughs> practicing to kill something <laughs> in the tree. So there you go. On that note, you guys have an amazing weekend and uh, go play some guitar. As always, I want to thank you guys so much every Friday for joining me and uh, look for the new videos this week. And as always, thank you for your time and no